In this module, I'm going to talk about the regulatory environment uh, for financial accounting. And this is information that's background information to the stuff that we'll be doing in the course. But it's important that you know that because it gives you a, uh, some knowledge about how the system works from here. So we're going to talk about this, these things that uh, we call generally accepted accounting principles. We'll talk about U.S. GAAP, U.S. generally accepted accounting principles, and we'll talk about international financial reporting standards uh, as, as well. So these, these things here. We'll talk about who makes the rules, and as, as you know, as, as business majors, a lot, we have a lot of jargon. And so here we're talking about the Financial Accounting Standards Board, the International Accounting Standards Board, and the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. We'll talk about the role of auditors, and then we'll end up talking about these guys, Sarbanes and Oxley. Uh, so let's get started uh, on the visual. So first of all, what are generally accepted accounting principles? In its broadest sense, they're just a set of principles, standards, and procedures that are used in the preparation of accounting statements. So they're basically a, a background series of rules, if you wish, but they're, they're broader than that. Uh, principles and standards and procedures that everybody kind of plays off the same, uh, same rules uh, in this. U.S. public companies operate under this U.S. gap. So when we're talking about preparing statements, the statements, most of the statements uh, that we'll see, we'll see international statements this semester as well, but we'll be talking about U.S. GAAP, or often just GAAP. Uh, most of the rest of the developed world uses something else. Uh, it used to be that U.S. GAAP was kind of looked at as, as the best accounting standards in the world, but the world has pretty much left us behind now with international financial accounting uh, standards. We are in the process of moving towards uh, these standards uh, through this process called convergence. Uh, <clears throat> and it's not because uh, uh, people got up one morning and said, gee, the rest of the world's doing it uh, another way. Wouldn't it be nice to be like them? Uh, this, is, this is about business and money and the big U.S. multinational companies who are filing statements in multiple multiple countries and multiple markets around the world have no interest in preparing two sets of, of, of books, essentially, two sets of statements, one, one for the rest of the world and one for the U.S. And so they have been pushing in quite successfully uh, for convergence. And I don't think that any of us are going to see a case where there's a press conference and people say, well, we're throwing out U.S. GAAP and now we're going to uh, start using this, this new system IFRS. But what's happening is that the U.S. GAAP rules are changing to mirror what happens on the international standards. Now that creates some special, uh, some special challenges here uh, for, for you. Uh, you are close to embarking on your professional careers and you're going to go into a world that is right on the cusp of this changed convergence. Some of the rules have already changed, others are changing. And I'll give you a feel for this and as we talk about various things throughout, throughout the semester. And so you're going to need to know the existing rules to be able to look at existing statements. And very early in your, your professional careers, some of those rules are going to change. And so we're going to talk about that uh, as we go on throughout the semester. Here is to talk about adoption of IFRS. This is a map uh, prepared by Deloitte, big big four accounting firm. And if you look at this, everything in in green uh, are are company uh, countries that have adopted the international standards. And if you look at who hasn't adopted them, uh, you know there's really one glaring exception among among the modern developed uh, countries and 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 that's us uh, right here and we are in the process and so as it says here developing plans to adopt and so we're under the way of convergence but if you say what are the other the other major economies the only other one and they are also in the process is Japan everybody else all of of western europe is ifrs uh, australia China, India, Canada, Brazil, Chile, all of the big markets uh, around the world are IFRS. And so you can see if you're a, a, a multinational company, you're dealing in all of these, all of these areas, uh, uh, you can see why there's a strong push uh, for IFRS uh, from these companies. Now let's talk about who makes the rules. How did these rules come about? Uh, 
The organization that has been around the longest in the U.S. is this thing called the Financial Accounting Standards Board. It is the rule-making body. It is nominally, and I say nominally, a private organization. It's a private organization. It's not created by government mandate, and uh, uh, it's a group of people who come together. But the only reason anybody cares about FASB is because the Securities and Exchange Commission created by Congress back in the 1930s and oversees all the financial markets in the U.S., the Securities and Exchange Commission says you will adopt FASB standards in the preparation of, of financial statements in order to be a listed company in the U.S. And so you and I could put together a private organization, come up with a whole set of accounting rules, and they might be wonderful, and we would be completely ignored. But if the SEC said, this are the rules you're going to follow, then that would be the case. Uh, and that's, that's where the power that FASB has. That also creates a political environment. And so I don't want you thinking that these rules were created completely objectively uh, without any political influence. There's all kinds of horse trading and things going on here. And so I've got, if you look up here in the, in the middle of this, uh, this chart, uh, a whole list of people, and this is, this is just a very small sample of the people who will be expressing their opinions from the AICPA, American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, FEI, Financial Executives, and don't worry about the alphabet soup here, uh, AAA, American Accounting Association, Financial Analyst Federation, Auditing Standards Board, all kinds of things, in addition to individual companies, individuals uh, who will go to FASB and lobby, they will go to the SEC and lobby, they'll go to U.S. Congress, and they'll bend the ear of their senator or their congressperson and say, <clears throat> we think this is very important that, that these are accounting rules, or we think it's very important that these are not adopted, they're going to hurt our business. And, and that gets, through the, through the kind of political process, comes out in these, these accounting standards. So it is, it's not a pure process where, where kind of the best accounting minds in the world sit down. Uh, all of those people do sit down, but they're subject to a political process that goes on. There's a relative new player since 2002 here, and that is the PCAOB, the Public, uh, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. It was created by Sar the Sarbanes-Oxley Act that we're going to talk about. And basically, it was set up to oversee U.S. auditing standards because some of the, the real uh, horrendous things that happen at Enron and WorldCom and MCI and some of these other places, they, they, there were some problems with, with the auditing standards. And so uh, the Congress, in passing the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, uh, effectively created the PCAOB. And, and so these two, the PCAOB and the FASB, uh, oversee U.S. accounting. So all of that is U.S., but you've got another group as well, and that is the international group that is here. And so there's a parallel group that have created these international accounting standards that, that we now see that are prevalent in the vast majority of the world and where we are going. And there is the foundation that created it, the IFRS Foundation, and the governing board, the, the, the international equivalent of FASB, is IASB, and, and they work in parallel. And these two have been meeting jointly, at least subsets and representatives of them, have been meeting jointly now for a number of years working on convergence. And in some cases, the IASB has moved things a little closer to U.S. GAAP, and in many, many more cases, FASB has moved us towards the international standard. So that's a, a brief overview of this uh, kind of melange of, of, of influences that create the rules in financial accounting. Let's talk about the role of auditors. <clears throat> every set of publicly, uh, every public company uh, has a set of audited financial statements, meaning that they hire companies, either mostly big companies, big, big four, uh, Price Waterhouse, Deloitte, KPMG, uh, or on down, Grant Thornton, uh, and, and further further down down the list from there, although the public companies rely on the on the bigger auditors from there. So the question is, what do they do? Well, number one, let's talk about what they don't do. They don't prepare the statements. Management is responsible for the preparation of the statements, and in the end, they're responsible for their accuracy. What's the role of the auditors? They are the outside experts on gap. They are the folks who are 
really supposed to be knowledgeable about what's going on. They're not brought in specifically to search for fraud. And when there's an engagement letter, it will basically say it is not the primary purpose for us to seek out fraud. And particularly where there is collusion uh, between uh, senior people in the company, it is entirely capable that you can trick the auditors in this. The, the auditors come in with the expectation that everybody is serving their fiduciary responsibilities and they come in as experts to help the management make sure that they are doing the right thing and they do tests, statistical tests, they don't look at every transaction, but they, they look and, and sample things to make sure that it's done right. Now, of course, if they find fraud, they're certainly going to reveal it immediately, but they're not, that's not their, their, their purpose. There are accountants that do that. If you suspect fraud, you bring in forensic accountants uh, and, and forensic auditors, and they have different techniques when they think there's fraud prevalent. Auditors are there to help management prepare the financial statements to be as fair and accurate as possible. But there's a big but. Management pays the auditors. So they're paid by managers, and auditors make their money by auditing companies. They not only want to audit this year, but they want to audit next year and for many years to come. And that creates this conflict of interest that is inherent in the auditing position. Auditors, for the most part, with, with only rare exceptions. Auditors are, are committed to doing the right thing, but they also have to deal with this fact that management interest and auditor's interest may not always align, and auditors have the incentive, the financial incentive, to allow themselves to be pushed as far as they can without going over the line uh, from here. So there is this conflict of interest inherent in the, audit, in the auditing process. So. Up into my next slide here. Let's talk about the Sarbanes-Oxley Act uh, of 2002. Sarbanes-Oxley was created in an environment where there had been a series of really big frauds, Enron being, being probably the most well-known, but there were a number of other, WorldCom, MCI, etc., uh, here. And the number one thing that Sarbanes-Oxley did was to put management on the hot seat responsible for these statements, because Every one of these people who uh, were indicted <coughs> and charged, some went to prison, some got off, uh, but almost without exception, their defense was very simple. I didn't know. I had no idea this was going on in my company. I was relying on people who worked for me, and they let me down. I am appalled that this happened. Sarbanes-Oxley took that defense off the table. Now management must certify that the financial statements are accurate, uh, no material misstatement, uh, everything is there. They must, they must certify that they have personally reviewed the internal control system. So they can't say, I thought I had systems in place, I didn't know it wasn't working. They have to personally review and basically guarantee uh, under subject of, of substantial fines and prison terms uh, should, there, should there be a fraud uh, that's happening on their watch. They also have to disclose all material off-balance sheet obligations. That's one thing going on with Enron. Uh, and so it really puts management. That, that's in some ways a small part of the act, but it's a very, very important part of the act from there as well. There's a specific report now on internal controls. Internal controls are that system that makes sure that what you think is happening is actually happening. And these things called 8Ks, they've always been around, but the, they have been strengthened now that uh, firms must disclose new information very quickly. And uh, many firms now file many, many 8Ks. It's better to, to file too many uh, than not enough. It's also changed the rules on auditor independence. One of the big driving forces that, that drove the Enron scandal uh, with Arthur Anderson was that Arthur Anderson was the auditor of Enron, but they were only getting about 20 to 25 percent of the total revenue they got from Enron from auditing. They were the majority of the revenue source 
that was going from Enron to Arthur Anderson was going from consulting services. And so the consultants were on one side putting together all of these things that were of questionable sort and coming back, putting pressure on the auditors going, don't, don't blow this for us. Uh, there's a lot of money on the line here. You really need to approve this. And so they created these internal conflicts of interest. Sarbanes-Oxley took that off the table. They have, if, if you are a audit company and you are uh, doing these services, uh, then you can't do any of these other things. You can't provide consulting. You can't provide bookkeeping. All of this other stuff from there. They also have reduced the ability of the companies to hire the senior managers uh, from there. Because what would happen if you look at the accounting firms uh, and you look at the companies that they audit, what happens is that there will be 10 people who will come into an accounting firm out of places like Bryant. Uh, and maybe one of those will stay and make a career. The other nine will take other jobs, and very often they will take other jobs with clients. And that happens at the very senior level. And so uh, there was creating a kind of a uh, too, too close a relationship with the top people in the audit team uh, being former colleagues uh, to the top people in the accounting. And so they, they restricted that, although that's, that's fairly, uh, it's fairly loose in how successful. In my opinion, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, or SOC, as it is, socks as it as it is often referred. I think this is the most important piece of financial legislation, not only in your lifetime but mine. Uh, I think you have to go back. I was born in the fifties. You have to go back uh, to the Securities and Exchange Act of nineteen thirty three, uh, thirty two and thirty three, in order to get something that has had as much impact of that. So it's a very important piece of legislation. So what are the key issues? Uh, in this uh, uh, this discussion here, I want you to, to to leave you with with basically three thoughts. One is there's this thing called Shanks axiom that basically says that no matter how carefully you you prepare a rule, there'll be people out there who can figure a way to follow the letter of the rule while completely avoiding the spirit of it. So they'll find a way to work around it while not violating the law, so to speak. The, we will see a lot of generally accepted accounting principles, and we'll talk a lot about this during the semester. GAAP is, there's a huge codification, tons and tons and tons of stuff written and ru rules that seem to be just incredible minutia, but there is still a huge amount of latitude. So don't think of GAAP or IFRS as an ironclad set of rules. They're really, there's, there's a lot of latitude. And finally, management has leeway. Management wants to make the financial statements of the company look as positive as they can, and in so doing, uh, they have some leeway to do it, and the auditors, while even while they're doing their job, have incentive to help them. Okay, look forward to seeing you in class.